Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome back for the next of our Mental Health Professionals Network webinar sessions. Uh, tonight's one is entitled Supporting the Mental Health of People Returning to Work After a Long-Term Injury. Uh, Welcome to the over 400 participants already who have uh, joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who may be uh, reviewing this on, on the, the podcast at a, at a later time. Mental Health Professionals Network particularly wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the, the many lands across Australia on which our webinar presenters and participants are, are located. We certainly wish to pay respect to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. Just to introduce myself, my name is Dr. Conrad Kungaroo. I'm a uh, private general practitioner working and living in Proserpine with Sundays in North Queensland. Um, been in rural practice for about 12 years now and uh, also been doing a bit of medical educating work over that time as well. It's, uh, it's certainly mental health and managing mental illness is, is something which all of us in rural practice see very, very commonly and I know that for all of us as clinicians working across Australia this is something which we're always trying to do the very best for our patients that we can with. So thank you very much to everybody who's, who's logged in. I'm hoping that everybody's had a chance to review the, uh, the, the case regarding Mark, Mark's story um, that tonight's webinar is, is based upon. Um, I'm also now going to, to move on and introduce you to the, to the panellists uh, that we've got joining us this evening. And we're going to start off with the, uh, Dr. Roya Bastin, uh, Dabastani. Um, Roya is a GP in, in Melbourne. She uh, works as a medical advisor for the WorkSafe clinical panel, but also remains in, in private practice in Melbourne. Um, Roya, just to introduce you to the, uh, to the participants, just wonder what are some of the other uh, common queries you get from GPs when you're doing some education for them? Hi, Conrad. Uh, some of the, the main sort of uh, queries would be surrounding uh, what, what duties the worker can do, whether duties would make the worker worse, and just sort of general concerns about certification and, and sort of facilitating a return to work um, whilst kind of collaborating with, with their own colleagues. Thanks, Roya. Thanks, Roya. That's, uh, that, that's great. We'll be hearing more from Roya shortly. Also moving on now to Dr. D.L. Fellman. Uh, D.L. is a, a psychiatrist who's in Melbourne. She's uh, specialised in occupational psychiatry, certainly one of the facets of the specialty which m many of us uh, haven't been too familiar with. D.L. has had many years of experience helping ill or in injured uh, workers return to, to the workplace. D.L., I'm just wondering, what have sort of been you know, the challenging cases you've seen in assisting people return to work? Um, I think by the time they come to see me, they're all a little bit challenged. Um, some of the more challenging ones I see is in particularly the high-functioning, quite perfectionistic, high-flying person who may not have had difficulties before and um, is very sensitive to their deficits and sees things as, as a bit all or nothing unless they can get back to their previous level, then they're, they're, they're not functioning. Um, and the other type of difficulty I see a lot of is, is when the challenge is when there's performance management difficulties and the challenge in teasing out what what's a capability factor and what's an illness factor that can be challenging. Absolutely, Dale, and, and those are, are certainly some insights that uh, that the audience will be keen to hear you explore a little bit further as we as we're going through the through the presentations. Moving on now to introduce Dr. Carol Egan. Uh, Carol is a, a clinical psychologist who, uh, she's also a, a um, educator to training psychiatrists also. Um, Carol's been the uh, director of training for the Institute of Contemporary Psychotherapy and she's co-authored a, a book on workplace bullying that provides a, a combined psycho and legal perspective. Carol, one of your interests is uh, people's relationship to their work satisfaction. How, how have you found an injury affects people's job satisfaction once they return to work? Uh, I find that it actually does depend on what, what sort of level they can get back to. If they can get back to the same level as before, then they're satisfied. But the biggest factor really is the employer's support and peer support, but particularly the employer's support. That means a lot to people. Thanks, Carol. It's uh, great to have you on, on board. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mary Wyatt. Mary is an uh, occupational physician with special interests in back pain and return to work management. Mary is also the founder of an education company providing resources to people involved in return to work management, so we're very grateful for her insight tonight. Mary, how would you usually be involved in a case like this? 
Um, well, sometimes as a treating practitioner and sometimes perhaps as an independent medical assessor, but I'm also been involved in back pain research and one of the real issues faced is beliefs and understanding about back pain and how to self-manage it and that's particularly applicable in Mark's case. We don't do a terribly good job of this as a medical profession and sometimes that helps create disability as Mark's experiencing. Wonderful. Thanks Mary. We'll be revisiting a lot of that as we, as we come along. So we, uh, we start this evening just acknowledging that uh, the, the work and the involvement of Safe Work Australia, uh, that, that they are the, the organisation who have provided the funding to host the, uh, the webinar this evening and the, the link there is to their website. So there will be plenty of resources available that we'll be referring to this evening you'll be able to find there. We also acknowledge that although uh, Mark's case certainly may seem atypical, this represents a, uh, a representation of the type of cases at Safe Work certainly do uh, see come, come through their, their case load. We just need to start off this evening just with a few of the ground rules, uh, particularly for those who are joining an MHPN webinar for the, for the first time. We ask that uh, everybody who's, uh, who's participating please remain respectful of other participants and panellists. Uh, although we're in a virtual space, please you know, act so that you were actually in a face-to-face -face activity. If you do have some comments which you'd like to, to share with the panel or questions which you'd like raised, use the general chat box which you'll find at the, the left of the tabs available lower in the screen. But however, if you are having technical issues and we notice that a few of you have been commenting on, on the audio so far, We'll pop those into the technical help box and we'll try to assist you with those as, as quickly as we can. Also do remember that the things that you comment on in those panels are visible to everybody so just uh, think before you press send. If you'd like to hide the chat, if it's becoming too distracting for you, there is a small, a small down arrow you'll be able to see at the top of the box to, to remove that. And uh, we definitely would love to, to hear from, from, all of the, from all of you as, uh, as participants on, on your experiences tonight so please make sure that when you do uh, exit the, the survey that you do, the, uh, the little feedback survey which will pop up as you, as you go. One thing which we are always uh, mindful of is that you know, we can all experience a range of experiences in our workplaces and I'm mindful that, uh, that some of the content in tonight's webinar may relate to past or current experiences of some of those who, who are joining in. Please be prepared with your own self-care plan to take care of yourself tonight, bearing in mind that this is a professional development opportunity and it's not really appropriately set up as a, as a platform for discussion of, of personal issues. The resource document and the website which we referred to have a range of support services and phone numbers if anyone does feel the need to discuss any concerns. But this is a professional environment. We really do hope that everybody can share, uh, share their, their, their thoughts, their, their questions and certainly hopefully enjoy the experience as we, as we go along. So we're just going to go briefly through the learning objectives for this evening. That we're looking that through an uh, interdisciplinary panel discussion about returning to work. At the completion of this webinar, we are hoping that participants are going to feel better able to describe appropriate practices to sufficiently accommodate abilities, diversity and vulnerabilities of people returning to work, implement some key principles of providing an integrated approach to the social and emotional well-being of people returning to work after compensated injury, and identify some of the challenges, tips and strategies in providing a collaborative response to supporting social and emotional well-being of people returning to work. So, the, uh, so who we're, we're talking about this evening, the panellists this evening are, are going to be focusing on, uh, the, the panellists are going to be focusing on Mark, a 30-year-old who works in manufacturing where frequent lifting, bending and long periods of sitting are, are required. He's had previously controlled back pain but he had, had, had some advice from his GP on this occasion to limit lifting to no more than 20 kilograms but he didn't actually in, in, inform the employer. Good relationships at work and happily married with two children involved in their soccer. Diagnosed with a herniated disc and his claim was accepted. Initially had one month off work but it was prescribed opiates but the pain continued and he ended up with an additional three months off work been reluctant to move and there's been a lack of in involvement in his normal activities despite GP encouragement. So we certainly recognise that there's a lot of challenges in, in Mark's presentation. We're going to move on now to, to Roya to share the GP perspective. Thanks Roya. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm just going to sort of speak as, as, um, just from the perspective of GP and, and talk about how I would uh, look at this case. Um, 
I think initially it's, it's very important to build trust uh, and make the make Mark aware that, that I'm acting as an advocate for him, um, but also that I'm still going to remain objective. And, and if he, you know, has other agendas, that that's not necessarily going to be facilitated. Um, it's important to take in, into account Mark's um, health and illness belief in general, um, including their surrounding the injury. Um, and work's role in that. Sometimes, you know, we find in the um, compensation setting that there's blame attached to things and a lot of bad feeling uh, from the get-go, uh, and that doesn't really help. Uh, so it's important to sort of talk about these things and, and try and nip them in the bud as possible. Um, the other important thing uh, which I try to address early is uh, to try and facilitate um, any worker remaining at work rather than uh, sort of signing them off as unfit and then trying to get them back to work. That's much more difficult. Um, I know certainly at work, so if we, we found that the statistics are a lot poorer um, trying to get someone back to work rather than just trying to keep them out of work. Um, it's important to ensure that sort of any management is, is measured and doesn't add more sort of drama to the situation, uh, which, which may already have uh, sort, of, uh, sort of other sort of problems associated with it. And, and, and this is a really great example, this case of how, you know, early use of scans, early use of... Uh, a certain language like herniated disc and things hasn't really helped Mark. Um, so uh, we're just leading on to the scans. Um, that was that was one of my initial bugbears with this case was was the, the speed at which the GP sent Mark to have a scan, and we see this a lot actually. Um, I see this a lot both in general practice and, and especially um, at work safe in Victoria. Again, avoiding the early use of uh, strong painkillers. Um, it's, it sort of gives the patient the wrong message, and it also actually leads to addiction. Um, also, just sort of just generally talking about pain education very early on, uh, and sort of reassuring a patient that pain doesn't necessarily mean worsening of pathology. Um, in general, I would say that conservative management needs to be exhausted um, completely, and, and we see a lot of cases where. You know, the patient's been sent to a surgeon very early and the surgeon will say, oh, the patient's had, you know, exhausted conservative measures and they've had maybe three weeks of physiotherapy, no psychology, not seeing an occupational physician, um, doesn't know anything about pain, basically. Um, so I think that's really important to, to just set things going in the right direction early on. Um, it's important to discuss uh, social support, psychological effects, um, Include colleagues early on if you think that there's risk, especially if there's pre-existing mental health issues, there's going to be a, a significant risk of things deteriorating in terms of the in terms of the workers' mental health. So it's important to involve psychologists, psychiatrists um, early on. Uh, when considering return to work, uh, it's important to try and remember that that incorporates a large spectrum of capacities. And one of the questions that I often get asked when I sort of call GPs to discuss these things. Is you know well I don't you know what jobs can they do, uh, and and the answer is it doesn't really matter what jobs they can do. It's what their capacity is. So if they can use their right arm, uh, and if or if they can answer the phone, uh, you just have to write you know that's what they can do. If they you know if there's a particular limb that they can't use, you just have to write that. And and it's up to you know then the occupational physicians and and whichever work safe bodies involved and return to work coordinators and all those sorts of people to get involved and. It's a good opportunity to hold something like a case conference as well, um, at which you can invite um, you know, all of those sort of specialists, including return to work coordinators and occupational rehab physicians and people like that, to, to actually help. It's, you know, it's much better to take a team approach to these things. Um, uh, and then, in general, I find forward momentum is really important. The number of patients that we see who you know, they've been in the system for two or three years and, and nothing's really moving forward in terms of treatment or return to work. And the longer that, that sort of status quo drags on, the less likely the patient is to ever get back to their old life, basically. So you really, I, think, I think anyone involved in a patient's care, whether it be a social worker, a psychologist, a GP, a psychiatrist, should, should just kind of sometimes just, you know, every month or two take a step back and, and say, is this patient actually moving forward, or you know, has anything changed in the last two or three months? And if the answer is no, then you know we need to sort of start again, see what see what the problem is. Um, 
and in general, all the way through the process, I think a lot, a lot of workers just feel like they're not being listened to, like they have no control over the situation. Uh, and I think it's really important to try and give them back some of that control. So I always, you know, would, would ask the patient what they would like to see happen, what they think about <coughs> that has already happened, um, and, and if they've got any suggestions or expectations for the future. Um, and that, that applies to, uh, you know, partners and, and things as well, because often you feel, you, you see breakdown in relationships. And, and, you know, just a simple breakdown in a relationship will, will change the whole course of a worker's recovery. So that's a really important thing to consider. Absolutely. So it really is, is key, Roya, to, to you know, still be able to provide that objective approach, but to provide that overall patient advocate experience, but to recognise when there's something more complicated going on and when we, when we need extra help. And certainly the psychiatrist perspective or getting specialist involvement is going to be necessary sometimes. And tonight we're going to be hearing from DL. Um, DL, I'm wondering if you can help take us through your perspectives on Mark's care. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so when, when I first saw this case nine months off on, my first thoughts were Mark is in a really big hole um, and the life of the new work, social, recreational, family, occupational is becoming smaller and smaller it would seem and, and, and harder to reach and I think he's going to need a lot of help getting out of this very big hole. I guess um, looking back on a case that goes badly, it's easy to um, criticise the treatment that's been given so far. I, and I think it's easy to criticise this one particularly, but I think the GP has done some positive things like engage physio at least and also try and get Mark engaged in some activities such as helping out with the newspaper for the sport. But I, I, I get the sense that it's um, too little too late really and I guess in this case the kinds of things that I'd be um, wanting to have seen happen would be much earlier identification of biopsychosocial factors and intervention for them. So we know that he's a young man with a back injury and he's got a job that's physically demanding. So we already know that it might be a bit harder for him to get back to his full capacity. There's compensation factors which can make cases more challenging. He's needing opioids very early. Um, he's got this obvious um, pain, fear, avoidance and maybe if that was picked up at, at the very start then interventions could have been in place to address that. He's all, it's already a re-injury possibly, he's had a prior history of back pain so he's back going to increase anxiety about a further injury. Um, he hasn't told his employer about his difficulties so are there issues with him not seeking help um, and the list goes on with possible um, concerns. So I would have liked to see much earlier um, collaborative um, specialist involvement and early psychological support. The other thing that really concerns me about this case is the prolonged certification from very early on, giving him three months off. is kind of sending a message, well, we don't expect you to recover in this time frame. Um, and it also, for some people, means that they don't actively see their GP on a regular basis. And I'd be hoping this man would see his general practitioner on a weekly basis um, with a situation like this. I'm not sure if you'll agree, Roya. So unfortunately Mark's journey is not one that is uncommon in, in, in what I see. In, in my experience um, people often have a, a physical injury that's associated with pain. Um, when they develop pain avoidance behaviours and become progressively withdrawn, it leaves them with a lot of time doing nothing. And I find that they spend this time ruminating and it might be ruminating about their stresses and fears but it's also more time to focus on pain. Invariably, they often develop mood and anxiety symptoms. They're medicated. They might self-medicate, and I wonder if a lot of Mark's opioid use is self-medication as well. And what I see happen is increasing psychosocial um, stresses for him. He's, um, he's having difficulties with his children, um, his wife. He's disengaged from social situations, and, and I see this progressive pattern of um, increasing symptoms and increasing functional impairment over time. In terms of what I would do to help Mark move forward. Well, the first thing I do is, is I think he, there needs to be time. This isn't the kind of situation that you're going to address quickly or in a short consultation. Um, I think engagement's going to be key in providing support. I think that what he hasn't had is a thorough assessment diagnostically. I guess the medical side, um, I'd leave to Roya or to Mary. Um, from a psychiatric perspective, there's possibly many diagnoses that this man could have, such as opioid dependence now. Um, he might get diagnosed with an adjustment disorder or depression. I wonder whether there were any traumatisation symptoms given it was a work-related injury, was there any um, threat there? Um, but I, I, I think I'd be reluctant to give him a diagnosis now while he's on such high doses of opioids as they could explain um, a lot of his psychological symptoms. 
I'd be looking for comorbidities such as other substance use issues like alcohol. I noticed that even though we've got a page and a half of what's been happening with Mark, we've got very little about what he can do. So focusing on what he is able to do, which will give us a platform to build on, would be useful. Understanding his motivation, what some of the barriers are. For example, is there a lawyer breathing down his neck telling him to go for total and permanent disablement? And I'd want to get a sense of his physical prognosis so we can look at return to work planning. The next steps I think are about education to him and his partner, aligning, getting him motivated and on side and working together with you. I'd be involving his partner really early to understand her concerns and address some of the issues she might not be aware of and also involving the workplace as soon as possible. It doesn't seem like they've been too involved. Um, I think recovery and return to work goal setting needs to be set pretty um, immediately. That doesn't mean that he needs to return to work tomorrow but there needs to be some sense that his treatment providers feel that he can recover and that a recovery is, is um, being aimed at and ideally he'd have a, a, a goal that he's going to go back to, whether it's his full duties or modified duties or an alternate job, it's unclear on the information I have. I think in someone like him it's really important to set very small steps instead of big ones, steps that he can achieve and it might be something like we've well, got a two year old son, how are you going to re-engage with him? Maybe this week you're going to read bedtime stories to him. Very small steps to give him a sense of achievement. I think he needs regular review and I think most importantly avoid harm, don't harm him further with more opioids. And I think you really need to get multidisciplinary supports involved and collaborate and case conference with everyone. Finally, in terms of treatment, my recommendation for where he's at now would be to get a thorough physical assessment of where things are at, um, reduce the opioids and better manage his pain address some of the psychiatric and psychosocial factors, so the um, ongoing legal issues um, related to his claim, um, help him to slowly reintegrate in his community, address the relationship issues. In terms of specific therapies, I'd be rec recommending some psychological therapy with a, a targeted therapy, cognitive behavioural therapy, activity scheduling, um, addressing fear avoidance, just want to make the point that I don't think all therapies are the same and in this man I'd be recommending against the supportive counselling on a monthly basis, it's just not going to cut it. With regards to psychiatric medications, I wouldn't be making any decisions about that now, I'd be getting him off the opioids. If you do find he need, would benefit from an antidepressant medication for mood or anxiety symptoms, then you could consider something like um, duloxetine for its pain reducing properties and that may also um, be an avenue for getting him to take it if he's reluctant to. And obviously rehabilitation provider involvement and functional restoration. And the last point I'll make on um, this case now is that I think when he returns to work, it's a time to continue treatment. I see a lot of cases where treatment stops as soon as someone gets back and I think that's not the time to do it. He needs increased support at that time. Dale, that's uh, that's that's fantastic. You know, it, it's in the, obviously the, the audience also are finding there's just some some, some great insights there, Dale, and, and thanks so much for bringing all those to us. And hopefully, we're going to get a chance later on to revisit some of those uh, some of those concepts because there's a, a lot of audience participation going on with that. But you're quite right that, that certainly involving the multidisciplinary approach early is is appropriate, and having a structured fashion to that is so important as well and we, we really are fortunate for the input of uh, such an experienced clinical psychologist as Carol Egan. Carol, I'm going to move on to you. What would your, your perspectives be on Mark's case? Oops, let's go back a minute. Uh, well, first of all, um, I think Mark, because he's been off for so long and he's avoiding everything, he would avoid me as well. Um, so I'd be firstly trying to establish a very strong working alliance with him. And I would take the approach of motivational interviewing simply because he's having so much avoidance and so much trouble that I'd, I'd um, try to find something that matters to him that makes him want to uh, uh, continue or won't makes him want to see me in the first place. Um, and I think that's largely what, what I could use as a lever would be that he's approaching a crisis. Um, his wife is losing patience with him and he might lose his job, so that raises the tension and you would think that would make him want to con want to do something about his state. But at the same time he fears pain and injury and has lost his place at work 
has lost his sense of belonging and relevance and he's withdrawn from his friends. And there's often a big uh, sense of shame with injury. Um, so in motivational interviewing, I'd be trying to work with his ambivalence, uh, help him to identify his avoidance as actually a pain strategy, a survival strategy, and, uh, and his social withdrawal is also a survival strategy. It's trying to avoid the shame and the pain. Um, so then we look at his pros and cons of that strategy. Is it working for him? Uh, he has to, it doesn't seem to be doing him much good if he's got so much loss of heart, low mood and so much conflict. And at the same time as addressing all of that, be trying to um, affirm his self-efficacy, his capacity for change and, to, and what he's been able to do in the past. And in a way, it's trying to awaken his need for change and commitment to that. So then we start to mobilise and change talk with him as well as actively listening for his desires and his goals and um, what he wants, what the levers are, keep his job and keep his wife and, and his kids and encourage his goals and dreams, his intentions and decisions but emphasise his ability and um, self-efficacy I had to look up what a press, press operator does and they've got considerable skills I and mean, it's problem solving, attention to detail, mathematical and computer skills, mechanical and technical skills, as well as needing some stamina. Stamina he might be having trouble with, but the rest of it should be intact. So we'd start to actually plan for him to combat the social withdrawal and reduce family tension by doing a bit more and Dale mentions the sort of small steps, or he could do a little bit around the house. It doesn't really hurt to wash up occasionally. And, um, and we start to move that towards an, ac an action plan for return to work. The roadblock, of course, is the stamina. That's where a lot of his anxiety is. And that's where I would be collaborating with his team, his doctors, his physiotherapists, to establish what are safe activities and develop a realistic stepwise plan with him. I try to help manage his depression and anxiety and um, his fear uh, and, and avoidance with um, CBT. Uh, but you also have to remember sometimes when people lose function like this, that it's actually a grief process. So I'd be concerned about being able to listen for long enough to his grief and to help him to move on past that and to find some of the positives in his life. Uh, taking steps, I'd um, try to facilitate his awareness in the moment of the avoidance strategies and above all, uh, help him to stand back and reflect more. I think most therapeutic modalities try to do that. But also acknowledge his courage and role of the resistance that he doesn't want to do anymore or if he wishes to, uh, to give up. He will fail at times, so it's necessary to... Um, stay with him through failures and losses. And um, I mean, DL mentioned that that needs to be done even after his return to work. Well, I agree very much with that. Um, now, let's assume that somehow we've been able to help him develop motivation and work through his loss and anxiety and depression. So then we can move into some regular collaboration with his case rehab manager about the return <coughs> to work plan. But it might be necessary to refer him for career management if it turns out that physically he might not be able to do um, his job and he might need to adjust and try to move into another area. Then I'd be looking to, to somebody like Mary Wyatt and the occupational um, position. Thank you. Thank you, Godwin. Thank you, Karen. That's uh, that's wonderful. It's a, it's a great great insight there, and I certainly notice a lot of the uh, a lot of the therapists in the the audience sharing a lot of your uh, your thoughts and uh, agreeing and uh, wanting to get into a little bit of debate later on on the, the treatment modalities. So hopefully we'll have an opportunity to to move on to those. But uh, yeah, th thanks Carol for for acknowledging that sometimes we do need to be able to take on the, the broader uh, broader view and the broader approach as well. And we are extremely fortunate to have Mary White joining us uh, this evening. Mary, we'll move on to, to you now for sharing your thoughts on Mark's case. Thanks so much, Conrad. 
that pain management is going through a transition. Uh, if you had uh, come along with back pain to the doctor 30 years ago, you would have been told to lie down and have some aspirin and morphine and stay lying down for six weeks. We have moved on from that, but we're only part way there. Good evidence says that advice and explanation and people understanding about how to manage their own back problem makes a material difference. We are no longer putting people to bed, but we are still overprotecting them, and this has likely happened in Mark's case. So the old way we used to manage back problems was to remove pain and tell people to rest, and the new way is to focus on restoring function. This is a slide which talks a little bit about the fear avoidance model, and this says that our fear of pain has a greater impact on our outcome than the actual pain level itself. So, and we're all, we're all on the spectrum somewhere, and at one end of the spectrum is, is the coper, and the, that's, for example, the farmer. So he gets some soreness in his bag, well, it just mucks him around with his hauling his bales of hay, but, you know, it's just pain. And at the other end is somebody maybe who worries a lot, who is anxious, uh, not confident in their own abilities, low self-efficacy. And so when they get a problem, whether it's their child having uh, drugs or their mortgage repayment problem or a back problem, they can be less confident and more worried and more fearful. Now, there's a great group of people in the middle and Mark is likely one of that group. It might be his next door neighbour had a bad outcome from a back problem. It may be something else that's going on in Mark's life, or it may be he just really doesn't understand about how to manage his back problem. And then that combined with the opiates that he's been given has set him down a path. I'm afraid as doctors, we tend to send people towards the avoidance end. We worry them more. We do all sorts of things such as a scan, which says they've got a disc problem or a degenerate disc. And so we tend to move people towards the avoidance end. It actually takes quite a lot of time to explain to people about that problems. And in everyday medicine, where consultations are typically short, this will often not happen. It rarely happens in general practice. Uh, it can sometimes happen with good physio practices where people are being seen over a number of occasions, and it happens in some specialist practice. So in, in Mark's case, this is a classic situation where prevention is better than cures. Um, as others have referred to, is there some issue that the case study says that Mark gets on with everyone, but are there are some untapped things that we don't know about. It's always worth discussing with a supervisor, what was Mark like before this happened, are there any other issues? So the, the way I'd approach this as a specialist in Mark at nine months is to really focus on his understanding of the nature of back, his back problem. In the resources I've sent, there's an interview with uh, Dr. Olga Indal who is a rehabilitation physician from Norway, and it's an oldie but goodie, and he is a, a fisherman, from the, and his family was a fish, fisherman from the north of Norway, and they're storytellers. So he has a very rich way of talking to people about their back pain, and I commend that to you to try and gain an understanding of the way we can talk to people about back problems. He has good evidence to say that if you give people a good understanding of their back problem, you can have half the rate of long-term disability, and Mark would be one of those typical cases. It's terribly important to stress to avoid opiates. Um, there are two main, I'll just I'll, I'll take another couple of minutes, there are two main types of back problems, sciatica, disc protrusion with sciatica, there's no indication that Mark has that, and then there's back problems. So um, for everyday back pain, even if the pain is bad, we should avoid opiates. There's a significant risk of dependency within a month. The dose needs to be increased and it makes people uh, often lower motivation and depressed. So terribly important that the main treatment for Mark is activity, keeping active, whether it's walking 30 minutes a day, walking in the pool, doing his own stretch exercises, but understanding and learning how he can manage his back problem is terribly important. 
and that's where I finish. Wonderful, and uh, there already has been a, a few participants wondering where they can get to those uh, to those resources you've mentioned. So, uh, for those who might want to click, and, and it'll, it will open up in a new tab for you. Uh, otherwise, if you can uh, click and save those um, those tabs for, for a later stage to go back and review. And of course, they're in the, the resources folder, which we're just highlighting down in the bottom right hand corner of the screen there for you as well. Well, we've certainly had a few perspectives there on on Mark, and uh, and we all we all recognise that there is a lot which could have been done much better for his uh, for his case at at, a, at an early stage, and that although he may be feeling as though things are really a bit of a rut at the moment, there's lots of hope still for us in in going going forward for him. We're going to try now just to get through uh, what probably is the more important part of the of the webinar, which is. The, the question and answer discussion for, for you guys with the with the panel, and uh, th looking at the questions you've been posting, but also the those that you took the opportunity to submit uh, with registration for us as well. So certainly one of our common themes that's coming up, uh, particularly in the earlier stages, Roy, was about patient advocacy and, and coordination of, of care for our, our patients. How do you think we can best coordinate the care of our patients through effective referral, communication with other health professionals? And even the employer. Uh, hi, yeah, I, I saw the question, and, and I think the advocacy bit is, is important as well. Uh, what I meant by advocacy, just just very quickly, is um, to uh, and usually, I guess, with me, I, I've been at the same practice for a number of years, so I've built up relationships with patients, so they trust me already, and, and they recognise that I'm their advocate, and I will be completely honest with them about things. So that that you can still remain objective whilst you know whilst the patient still believes that you're there for them uh, and you can still be honest with them. Uh, so I'll, I'll very honestly sometimes say to patients, you know, do you actually want to go back to work? Is this something you want? Do you enjoy your job or, or do you actually want to do something different? So that's just, just getting through the advocacy bit. But um, in terms of a collaborative approach, I think it's it's really important to, um, and I guess it's easier for me because of, of the work that I do at WorkSafe has given me an insight into to, to the other side of that wall, if you like, to see how things can go wrong when things aren't done correctly. Um, so, you know, utilizing all sorts of, of um, specialists, we've, we've talked about some of it already, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, occupational physicians, social workers, and it's important for all of those specialists to be on the same page in terms of pain um, and disability and injury and all, all those sorts of things. And it's, it's interesting to see all the comments because they're, they're quite varied, um, which is good. Um, but I think if it's important to have a collaborative approach and for everyone to be on, on roughly the same page. Um, so, you know, sometimes, you know, if you're thinking of a psychologist you're referred to, for example, or a social worker or a counsellor, they have to have a similar attitude towards pain and disability and things like that. So for me in this case, you know, I, I see Mark as, as the victim of, of his... Of, of his sort of, uh, the, the choices of his GP as well, to be honest. You know, the fact that he's been diagnosed with a disc prolapse and herniated disc, you know, other specialists or other people, other professionals might look at that and think, okay, well, he, there's no way he can do his usual job and go, go back to work again. And, and I actually don't think that at all necessarily. I have plenty of patients who've got far worse, worse pathology who do go back to physical jobs. So I think it's, it's all very, um, you know, anything's it just you just have to involve professionals early. Utilize things like case conferencing, uh, and I know that um, WorkSafe in Australia and Victoria at least is, is very keen to fund case conferences, and, and I'm sure it's the same in other states. Um, and that's a really useful way for everyone to get into the same room uh, and, and just honestly discuss things, and you know, include the patient as well. Has that answered the question? Sorry, I was wondering. Wonderfully, wonderfully, Roy. I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, uh, Ingo, I'd noticed you'd uh, been been raising a couple of questions there earlier about that type of thing, and hopefully that's brought a little bit of insight there as well. Uh, any of the other panelists uh, if you'd add any more on on that point there? Okay. Well, another of the the important themes is, is coming up there, and just noticed a, a few more is just looking at some of the, the barriers in the successful return to to work. DL, uh, you know, we, we remarked on, on what happens when there's the loss of the the, um, the earner role, and but also what happens with the loss of financial support after a return to work, and that's certainly an area which might provoke some anxiety for the for the patient, uh, as at that point is coming uh, closer and maybe even impairing their recovery. 
you found that uh, when patients are in the process of pursuing legal action, uh, maybe for, for, a comp for a payout and involving the legal profession, does that really complicate the process? Oh, it most definitely does and I'll answer this question um, from my perspective which are as a treatment provider helping injured workers return to work but also doing some consultation for employers um, and, and some insurers and, and I say, see this um, sometimes um, play out really, really badly but I, we also have to remember that sometimes it can play out really, really well for people who are quite disabled and are really relying on um, those benefits and, and potentially a total and permanent disablement. Um, benefit. The ones that I have the most difficulty with or cause me the most distress though are the ones where um, from the outset incapacity um, is probably discretionary where maybe they could have stayed at work um, except they were certified as unfit or they could have done alternate duties and in those cases I often see a lot of difficulties with, with them going down this pathway and, and needing to prove their incapacity for insurance purposes. Um, some of the horror stories I see are when um, for example lawyers are involved and I've heard on many occasions um, patients being told you must stay at home for the next six months, you can't be seen going out for coffee, seeing friends, mm -hmm. doing any exercise and that's, that's a really, um, a really frequent occurrence and also in patients that I see some of them say they're just scared to go out because they're scared of being caught on surveillance, they've heard the insurance surveil them um, and one of the most, the biggest challenges and I think this is important for everyone listening tonight is the cases where there are ongoing legal issues or fights for total and permanent disablement benefits where the treatment provider certifies them totally unfit until the issues are resolved and I think that these people become increasingly entrenched in the sick role, the level of injustice just fuels, they're constantly being re-triggered by the stress they've faced and the outcome is, is often very, very poor. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant insight, DL. Thank, thanks so much. For that. Any other panels? Uh, anything more to add on, on that point at all? Yes, Carol here. Yes, I, I found that people don't even start to get better until the legal processes are finished. Because they're, they're, until that time, they're suspended with not knowing what's going to happen next, whether they're going to get a payout, whether they can go back to work. They're just they're stuck. And I see that um, later on in the in the claims, but early on, I think if we can try and get um, some of these patients to replace negative experiences and negative memories with more positive ones, the outcomes can be much better. Yeah, but it's, it is a <laughs> such a challenge. Indeed, it is. Indeed, it is. Mary, oh, wait, could, I just, could I just add to that, Conrad? Just. Yeah, we need to be a little bit cautious also because sometimes, I mean, we all, we all, I think, have a sense that when there's legal involvement, things go down, down the hill. Um, but sometimes legal involvement comes because there's been a problem. Uh, people will often only go to a lawyer when they really can't get their issues dealt with. Mm, and true. so sometimes there's a cause and sometimes there's an effect. I think probably more often an effect, but anyway, we have to keep that in mind. Mm. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. Yeah. Mary, um, some of the other participants and, and some of the, the audience have been commenting on that maybe sometimes the barriers are, are just too, uh, too, too great and that we might need to look at considering broader alternatives. I was wondering, you know, particularly when there has been a prolonged absence from the, uh, from the workplace or you, seemingly insurmountable barriers for, for successful return, how do you feel we can best support workers if we're needing to start considering alternative roles? Well, there's a traditional hierarchy of options and starting with the pre-injury role, I agree with Rhea, we shouldn't discount the pre-injury duties. Um, good quality studies say that about a third of the population has backache most of the time, a third has episodes of back pain and a third of the population never gets back pain. So it's a pretty common experience. Uh, and in any one year, 10% of the population will have an episode of back pain which is disabling. That stops them doing their usual tasks. So just because Mark's had an episode which has really been very painful, um, and be just because he's on opiates and he's had a bad, he's got a bad situation at nine months from all sorts of angles, doesn't mean 
but we can't get him back to his usual lifestyle. It could be a long road and the chances might be relatively low, but I think that should be that would be my first goal, my primary goal, over the first couple of months and see how things went. The next option to consider is what else can he do? Is there a modified version of his usual role? Is there another job at the same workplace? It seems to have been good relationships. Can we restore those? As the next option, what else can we support Mark to do? And this is where engagement is so terribly important. Mark's lost his identity, his identity of a good worker and a family man. And so we now have to, as, as others have beautifully said, we now need to tap into what does he want. So we've got to start in thinking about the future. And that might take six months for him to even, you know, get to the point where he can start to be involved in retraining. What is it he wants to do? The key, the key is engaging him. What is he interested in? If he has to go and job seek for some bidding job, I'll bet you my second bottom dollar, he won't get another job. So we really have to involve him as a person, not a vocational assessment that identifies um, jobs that are not appropriate for him simply to stop his payments. We need to pull Mark in and of course there are many things he may well be able to do in the future. There are many transferable skills he'll have in that role. Brilliant, brilliant Mary. Thank you very much for, for that. Any other comments from the other, the other panellists on, uh, on the other alternatives or the other sort of planning for the future that we could offer somebody like Mark? I think it's, it's Carol. I think it's quite a quite a jump for some people to actually think about doing something else, about changing their career or moving into another area. It's, uh, and, and support from um, the employer and and from peers can be very helpful there. Thanks, Carol. Carol, while we've got you there, uh, some particular thoughts which were coming up during your presentation was obviously from uh, from some therapists and, and psychologists who have obviously got some very passionate views about the different mod modalities of, of treatments which are available and just thinking about the useful therapeutic uh, interventions. Have you found there are particular modalities of psychological therapy which are a particular benefit in assisting these patients, especially if there's intercurrent um, disorders such as an adjustment disorder or, or depression also going on? Uh, yeah, so I think if you stick to one model, I think it's, um, uh, it doesn't actually work, I find, in most cases, but maybe that's because I see the more complex ones. But I, I find that you, you can say, say in the case of Mark, I think motivational interviewing is, is good for him. So might um, acceptance and commitment therapy be good for him. But the, sometimes it's even more complicated. Uh, you know, if somebody's actually had injuries before or traumas before, uh, particularly complex trauma, uh, then you have to spend a lot of time working through the the emotions about that before you can even get to any motivation. Um, so, as I said before, there's grief work that sometimes you must do first, if, particularly if they've lost a lot of function um, or any function. And then there's their, their core beliefs. Uh, that they develop, such as I'm damaged goods, um, and there's a sort of hopelessness goes with that. You could be using a lot of CBT or something like that. It depends on how motivated the person is and how capable they are of actually doing that sort of problem solving. Um, uh, in that, what I sometimes do is ask someone if they're capable, I ask them to do some trauma informed yoga and mindfulness as well as seeing me uh, and I, th I think a multi-pronged attach and some flexibility in the models is important. I think models have their limitations. And uh, yeah, there's certainly some, some comments that, uh, that you, you know, it's all about building the relationship and actually having that That's therapeutic right. relationship is probably actually the the, uh, the more important part of it and it's great to see That's so right. many of the therapists uh, participating tonight uh, mm -hmm. looking at all of those those different options. So I'm not going to pretend to be the expert on all of those but I'm so glad to hear that everybody's uh, finding their, their own ways which have been particularly useful. 
there are two things there. I think uh, building that therapeutic alliance is essential, but another thing is that most models are actually trying to improve the reflective capacity of the patient, the ability to stand back and reflect rather than being in, immersed in the symptoms or the emotion. Right, right. Dill, there's been quite a, a few comments from the uh, from the, the participants about how what might we manage uh, suicidality. You know, once once hopelessness is is entrenched and uh, and we've really got somebody who is starting to feel as though they're they're losing their purpose in in life. Uh, I guess that the thoughts of uh, self harm and, and suicidality probably do start to, to creep in. And chronic pain. You've already mentioned about the the role that. The opioids are going to have in uh, in clouding his, his judgment and uh, his insight. Have you got any insights to share for the for the audience about how we might uh, assess or, or address suicidality in, in somebody yeah. like this? Sure, I think it's a really good question and a really important one. And um, suicidal ideation is a very um, unfortunately quite a common um, experience in, in people such as Mark. Um, I think the first thing to do is be aware of it and be mindful of the fact that, that um, suicidal ideation and hopelessness might be there and, and make it okay to, to talk about it. That doesn't mean going through a checklist and questions obviously of the session and asking about it, but just making it okay to talk about um, the general topic. And I, I also think that it's really important to involve others with, with a lot of my patients who might be experiencing suicidal ideation, it, especially, um, well I shouldn't stereotype, but often um, with some of the men, it's more the, the, the partners that come in and tell me they're really worried and I think bringing the partners into the sessions is, is, is really invaluable. And then I think if, if it's present, it's about not necessarily catastrophizing it unless there's an immediate um, plan or intent. Obviously, if, if that's the case, then there's um, emergency pathways to follow, but um, managing it and helping them to um, find some hope and some meaning and some purpose and, and try to help them open up some, some doors. The way I'd approach it. Any other panelists got any any, any thoughts there uh, to, to share on, on that important question? I, I agree, um, and I've actually, you know, Jay and I have shared a couple of patients, and one or actually both of them have been suicidal at one point or another. And I think just talking talking about it with the patient openly and talking about it with each other, um, sort of. Uh, really reduces anxiety for all parties um, and enables sort of calm uh, management planning, at, you know, timely management planning. Yeah, I think with these cases as well, we've made we've seen them quite regularly between the two of us um, and we've made them feel very um, strongly that there's a real support team around them that, that, that will help them move forward. Absolutely, yeah. Another thing we're certainly noticing is that we, we obviously have got a, a national audience joining us this evening and it's obvious from a lot of the comments which are coming through that there are different rules and uh, different systems which apply in each of the states and, and we are mindful that the comments which we're making tonight may not be applicable to every jurisdiction around Australia in terms of the, uh, the, the, the providers and the processes which are going on but certainly in the, the resources folder you'll be able to find the relevant links to the States borders uh, that might be in, in the area where, where you particularly are, are working and, and living. So, well, thank you very much to uh, to, to the panelists for, for all of those uh, wonderful insights and, and presentations. It's it really is a complicated area to uh, to to delve into, but we've seen that working together, having the, the patient as an active participant, encouraging an early return to to work, and being able to explore the things that they can do rather than dwelling on the things that they can't are all some really important uh, points to, to, to take away from, from this. So uh, look, I'm, I'm wondering if we might just give the opportunity for, for each of the panellists just to, to share their, uh, their little wrap up of, the, uh, of the, the, the session and the take home messages that, that they'd like to, to send our participants off with. So Roy, we might just uh, start back with you there on, on that. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think everyone's already said this, but try and be as collaborative as possible from the beginning, uh, really develop a good relationship with the patient and, and trust and I really think that things can be directed in the right direction. It, it, that's fine. I think it's really important to set things off on the right footing to begin with and, and unfortunately with, with Mark it's, it's a very common example of how things have slightly gone off, off skew and, and how it's a domino effect when, when one thing is kind of not done quite 
correctly, other things kind of lead from that. But I mean, even if that happens, involving other other professionals uh, in a timely fashion can still bring things back to to a good outcome for everyone. Thanks, Roy. Yeah, well, do you got some um, some simple messages there, some some take home messages for the for the audience too? Yeah, and I I think my take home messages are probably similar to everyone else's. I think the first thing is to try and stay at work in any capacity, even if it's just a couple hours twice per week. And if you can't um, stay at work, then plan an early return to work. I think identifying and addressing barriers thoughtfully early on is really important. Um, align with your patients and collaborate. And one thing I didn't get a chance to speak on today was this: like the, the, the collaboration with the employer. And I think open, transparent lines of communication. The more information you can tell them about their functioning, their capacity, their prognosis, it e the easier it is for them. A lot of cases I see is when the employer sends them off for an assessment because they just don't know what's going on. Not that they don't want to help, but they don't know how to. Focus on function rather than disability. Um, is, is the other big thing that I'd recommend. Thank you. Thanks, Tia, and, and absolutely. Look, having that that communication open uh, really to the benefit of, of everybody. And you know, we'd already mentioned previously involving the patient as an active part of that. You know, it's it, often when when things are going as letters, it's not all that difficult to CC the patient in. Uh, I always try to make sure that they understand the certificates, understand the the letters and the referrals that that they're getting and, and uh, that they're actively participating all, all the way through there, there with it. Um, Mary, have you got some, uh, some take home messages that you'd, you'd like to share with the, with the audience this evening? Rather than repeat what's been said already, I might just add in something else. Um, identify resources early. So again, prevention is better than cure. Who could have helped in the early stages? Uh, we haven't talked much about physios. This is a mental health webinar. Uh, good physiotherapists and in Victoria, physios are becoming more active in certifying and advice and explanation. But identify who in your group or uh, colleagues is best able to help this chap early on and help him actively manage his back problem. It is time consuming to re-educate people and give them advice and explanation, but find who that is. Generally not a surgeon, um, but it will often be a physician or perhaps a musculoskeletal physician. Wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Mary. And Carol, I'm going to give you the opportunity to uh, to, to share your your final thoughts on on the, the case and and particularly with the uh, the many esteemed colleagues you've got in the audience as well on what your messages are for tonight. So. This might seem a little off track, but because I think everybody has said so much already about the important things, like the relationship with the patient. But I would like to concentrate on the self-care for the therapist and the people involved. Sometimes these patients are quite distressing. They take a long time to get better, and you have to be able to stay the course. So your own supervision and your own capacity to manage the the uh, very heavy emotions that these people bring in and also sometimes the very distressing circumstances. I think it's important to look after yourself. Thanks so much, Carol, for that, that really important insight. And, and that's, uh, that's an important message for all of us. That, and that's why we have collaborative networks and collaborative webinars and events like this, that, uh, that you do know that you know, we, we all do end up working in, in silos to some extent. But there are a lot of other uh, professionals out there sharing the, the same stories, uh, experiencing the same types of cases, and, and trying to help out the same types of patients. So you know, being aware of your resources for, for your own protection and support, as well as for those of your patients, really is so, so important. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. But more importantly, thank you, participants and, and, and audience members for your, for your participation. Um, we would really love you all to, to make sure that as you're logging out, that you do fill out the, the brief exit survey, which is going to be popping up in there. And uh, this evening is, of course, eligible for your CPD, and your, your certificates of attendance will be emailed out within a couple of weeks. There you will also find the link to the online resources, which uh, which we've included. Uh, that'll be coming up in, in the next week. MHN, of course, conducts a series of, uh, of webinars throughout the year as we're, we're moving on. We're certainly not slowing down yet. The next of the, the series uh, on, that you'll be having will be uh, on forced adoption. That's coming up next week, 
the ripple effects of forced adoption and uh, I'd certainly encourage those of you in APS to be uh, signing up for that one. And of course Veterans Affairs has, uh, has asked uh, NHBN to assist with another one on the very important area of responding to and treating post-traumatic stress disorder and particularly what works. That's going to be held in a fortnight from this evening on Tuesday the 25th of October. There will also be another one coming up on caring for young people with gender dysphoria in 9th of November as well. So certainly do make sure that you're, uh, that you're logging on for, for everything as, as you go. Um, we'd also just make sure that for those who are interested in, in joining a mental health professionals network, um, that there are going to be some in, in your local area. So there is a, a link there. You can see what might be active that you can join into or join as a facilitator in, indeed. And mhpn.org.au will have plenty of those areas on there. So particularly when you do know that, look, you know, that this or is many of the other many areas in mental health care might be a little bit of a special interest for you, please do share your experience, share your energy and your enthusiasm and, and, and get involved. It really is a wonderful experience to be part of. So uh, as Carol just so rightly pointed out, that we do have to look after our, our own self-care in, in these, these matters. So certainly before I close, uh, we would love to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in, in the present. Thank you everybody for participation this evening. It's been a pleasure to, to bring it to you on behalf of Mental Health Professionals Network. Thank you all for your contribution and participation. We'll see you next time. Good evening.